Okay, this video is about Jill Bolt Taylor, PhD. She's neurology hero number one. So Jill Bolt Taylor was a neuroanatomist in Boston. She was 37 years old when she had a big stroke. She had an intracranial bleed from an arteriovenous malformation. They're often called AVMs. She became hemiplegic, you know, paralyzed on one side of the body. It was a bad enough bleed that it was compressing her brain and needed to be surgically drained. So they had to open up her skull. So crany, skull is cranium. Otomy is to make a hole in something. So they did a craniotomy to drain the bleed. Now, most patients who have a stroke, they do rehab for about three months or less. Let's call it intense rehab for about so-called three months or less. And it's difficult to rehab stroke patients. A lot of stroke patients have bad outcomes, okay? You know, little tiny strokes like um, basal ganglia lacunar infarct or coronal radiata lacunar infarct, something small, like about the size of a centimeter in diameter, those often do relatively well. But I'm talking about a big cortical convexity stroke they often have very poor outcomes. Uh, part of it's just because of the nature of the stroke itself, and also it's difficult to rehab patients. A left brain stroke, the language side, the patient will have language difficulties, difficulty speaking or difficulty understanding, or both. A um, right brain stroke is a problem as well because a lot of these patients will have sort of a c'est la vie attitude. Oh, that's life. What are you going to do? They don't, they're not motivated to rehab. They'll often have a... Uh, left side of the body like a neglect um, and so it's difficult to get them to do more rehab my father had that type of stroke and um, he'd always say oh I'm doing fine I'm doing fine I'm doing fine it was very frustrating um, he had had an open heart surgery I had wanted him to go vegetarian and he didn't listen to me and I didn't know enough then to force the issue it was many many years ago so he had an open heart surgery. It's a coronary bypass graft. And they take one thing, they take a lima, left internal mammary artery, and put it down to the left anterior descending of the heart. So it's called a lima to the LAD of the heart. Left internal mammary artery to the left anterior descending artery of the heart. And uh, he came through the heart surgery pretty well, but he was shoveling snow about four years later, throwing it over his shoulder, and he dissected his vertebral artery. And I think it's because the vertebral artery was stapled, you know, down through the mediastinum, the soft tissues as they pass down to the heart for the bypass. So it was fixated. The point being is a fixated artery is more prone to dissection than would be a normal free uh, floating artery that's not going to be pinned down to something and is vulnerable to dissection. And then when he dissected, he got a clot in his vertebral artery, embolized, went up to his brain, and he had a stroke. I know that because he had an initial MRI, magnetic resonance arteriogram, that was abnormal, slightly limited by motion, it was repeated. A day later, and then it was open. The artery was open such that the embolus had lysed, but it was too late because brain tissue can only survive, you know, about four minutes before it dies. So even if the embolus lyses, you know, a day later, it really doesn't matter. Um, so getting back to Jill Bolt Taylor, when she needed to rehab herself after her stroke, she went to her mother's house, which is a smart move, a loving, safe place. And there she could stay in parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, which means, you know, there's an accelerator to break. Sympathetic autonomic nervous system is like the, the accelerator, and pans, parasympathetic, is the break, if you will. And so it means low stress. Parasympathetic phase of our, you know, yin and yang nervous system here is like to rest and digest, to feed and breed for all these relaxed things we do to maintain ourselves. So anyways, being with her mother, perfect. She was able to sleep as much as she wanted every day. She could sleep 14, 16 hours. And then every day, she would just try to do a little bit more to increase her physical and mental abilities. So she was coming back from being unable to speak, paralyzed on one side of the body. She made a complete recovery, which is rather incredible. Now, you could also say she had a different type of stroke. She didn't have an arterial occlusive stroke where the brain tissue is infarcted. A large amount of brain tissue was infarcted and damaged. She had a stroke whereby brain tissue was pushed on from the bleed, but not that much was truly infarcted. So that would give you a better prognosis in that sense. On the other hand, she had to go for craniotomy when they crack open a skull and have to scoop out the bleed around the brain tissue. And it was a arteriovenous malformation that can also damage brain tissue. So her recovery is still quite extraordinary. It, it really is. And she's a beacon of light and hope for other stroke patients. And of course, the best thing to do is to prevent a stroke. 
But the, the most useful things that could be learned from this are that she didn't need any high-tech fancy stuff. Don't get me wrong. The surgeons did a fantastic job, the neurosurgeons, draining her bleed and preserving brain tissue. They did a great job. But in terms of her recovery, what she needed was her mother and to just sleep a lot and every day try to do a little bit more and keep on doing that for eight years. You can get new neurons to grow. That's neurogenesis. Um, you can get new mitochondria to grow inside of uh, your neurons. That's called mitochondrial biogenesis. You can form new small blood vessels. That's angiogenesis. You can store more glycogen within a neuron and a glial cell. That's um, glycogen supercompensation, especially in the glial cell. You can, you know, the key point is eight years of rehab. She didn't stop rehabbing. Lots of stroke patients would do much better if they had that kind of motivation. She had an advantage, too. She worked as a Ph.D. neuroanatomist for a living. So she knew quite a bit about the brain and quite a bit about what rehab could potentially do through um, formation of new neurons, for example, uh, neurogenesis. Um, you know, you can get reorganization of some cortical areas to take over functions that were previously taken over by different parts of brain. Um, that cortical reorganization can be like a substitution, if you will. Um, also on the adjacent tissue called perilesional takeover, whereby it assumes the function of the adjacent brain tissue. Um, and this is a willful, intentional rewiring of the brain, if you will. Um, the older a person is, the harder it is to do this. Um, with a kid less than two years old, you can take out half their brain, let's say, for treatment of surgery, and the kid can be normal. By the time they get to six years old, that's not possible, but... The big lesson, stroke rehab patients can do much better than is widely recognized, but they got to understand it and put that effort in every day and have a good environment for it. She has a super famous uh, TED Talk with like 27 million views, and her book was a big bestseller, Stroke of Insight. So she is um, provides a lot of hope for somebody trying to rehab from a major neurological injury.